Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, thank you for joining us for this webinar on some key skills and tools for running an efficient dental practice. Today, we're going to cover some topics that we think will assist you in running your practice more efficiently, focusing specifically on dental. So before we get started, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, you can hear us talking and uh, any questions we'll respond to during the course of the webinar. But firstly, uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. Um, Marion Mackay is an expert in business and human resource management, counselling and group work. Marion is a fellow of the Australian Association of Practice Management and has great experience working with dental practices, supporting them in their practice management strategies and accreditation activities. Our other presenter today is Karen Garth. Karen is a certified practice manager and she has many years experience in dental practice management, including five years running a large multi-site specialist dental practice. And during her time at the Australian Dental Association of New South Wales, Karen provided support to members who were preparing for the rollout of dental accreditation. Karen's also the Senior Operations Manager here at Practice Hub, and she's very well placed to share her knowledge of systems and processes. And Karen is also a Fellow of the Australian Association of Practice Management. I'm Anna Maria Gibb. I'm the Senior Product Manager here at Practice Hub. I'm also the co-founder of My Practice Manual, which was the precursor to Practice Hub. So I have a real passion for setting up systems and processes in practices to make them run more efficiently. A quick overview of the topics that we'll be covering in today's webinar. First of all, we'll be talking about managing equipment. So the maintenance, the calibration of the equipment, um, in and who is responsible for looking after those. We'll talk about human resource management. So the importance of consistency and transparency when you're managing your team. We'll talk about infection control. So the processes, the training that's required and the compliance to ensure that your practice is safe and your patients are safe. And we'll look at risk and quality improvement and importantly, the importance of a whole of practice approach. Um, and finally, I'll pull it all together with a demonstration of Practice Hub, focusing on how our Practice Hub platform can support those particular activities um, in helping you run your practice more efficiently. Before I hand over to Karen to get us started, just a quick word about accreditation. So there's been a fantastic uptake of voluntary accreditation in the dental sector, which I think is an indicator of the area's commitment to quality systems and processes. But even if your practice isn't getting accredited, a lot of the material that we cover today is still particularly relevant, covering things like policies and procedures, recording equipment maintenance and calibration and conducting audits. In our experience, they're the sorts of things that many of you are already doing, regardless of whether you get accredited or not. But this is about setting up those systems. And quick word about some of the resources that we'll be referencing today. So many of the resources that we'll reference will be from the ADA. Some of those are on their website and in the public domain, but others are behind the member wall. But given that they're the peak body for dentists in Australia, I suspect that most dentists are members and it's really worthwhile checking out the resources that they have available. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Karen, who's going to talk to us about uh, equipment. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Anna Maria, and welcome everyone. Let's begin with managing equipment. We are all aware of the vast array of equipment required to provide your patients with a high standard of dental care. New equipment is expensive, as are the cost of repairs, maintenance and calibration. Although all of this is a necessity to meet all of our compliance guidelines. If a piece of critical equipment breaks down, like your autoclave, do you have a procedure in place? Who arranges for a loaner with your service provider? What happens if none is available? How many days can you operate without an autoclave? In my past experience, we had multiple autoclaves 
And due to the volume of instruments and number of practitioners, we still required a loaner if the autoclave could not be repaired on site. By having a good service agreement with one provider and building a good relationship with that provider definitely pays off during these times. Who's responsible and maintains your annual service agreements? This includes your calibration schedules, updating your registers for all repairs, annual maintenance, documenting the dates, plus the storing of your certificates. As we had practice hub, this is where I kept all the equipment records and dates recorded. Then the reminders would alert me when servicing was due. Could never forget. Does your team raise concerns with faulty and broken equipment at your staff meetings? And if so, are they actioned in a timely manner? Thinking about the costs of equipment and maintenance, these costs should be regularly reviewed and be included in your budget planning process. This will reduce the bill shock and allow you to, play, to plan the best time for your practice to arrange for, for your annual maintenance and calibration. And you will know these best downtimes in your practice. Could be when the doctors are having annual leave or if there's time being blocked out of the appointment book that they're attending a conference or a training course. Also planning your budget for the replacing old of new for new equipment, including computers, software, and your furniture. All team members require regular training regarding the use of your equipment, plus the correct cleaning techniques. This helps to ensure the longevity of your equipment. By the team following the manufacturer's guidelines, this protects your warranty. Okay. Thanks, Karen, and welcome to you all. It's good for everyone in any business to have an awareness of the importance of financial management and the systems and tools to record and balance costs. As Karen was talking about budget planning, it's considered an essential financial tool when it comes to purchasing However, if we fail to plan, we can easily plan to fail. Excel spreadsheets provide flexibility by assisting us to create many effective templates. As we probably all know, if we've used it before. These templates can be specific to our practice needs. While we are able to find copies of templates for budget planning via the internet, I would suggest if you're unsure, it would be really helpful to seek your practice financial advisor's guidance first, just to keep on the safe side. Leading the way with each and every work colleague requires open, honest, transparent and clear two-way communication. That might seem quite obvious to us all, but for some it may not be quite as clear. So I will talk about that a bit more. By this, I'm referring to eliminating confusion that can occur when you're training and developing skills or sharing information with others. For example, we might be really clear about what we are saying and talking about, but the person listening to you may be unsure or could be struggling to understand or could be feeling confused and or might be experiencing anxiety. Initial training that is new to us all can be particularly challenging for a new employee who may be initially feeling overwhelmed with all that is, they have to learn and most importantly, understand why they're doing it. Just to add a little bit of information there, there's a couple of websites that I think will be really handy for teams and for um, leaders. Head to Health. Google it. It's a great source. It's got lots of information to help us who are trying to help others to understand what they might be going through. We're all aware that Beyond Blue is available. You can search online. They've got a great section on Beyond Blue workplace mental health videos. Now, this could be working with somebody who has who's struggling with anxiety. Another fine website to explore. Again, just Google Beyond Blue. Then let's look at position descriptions that are written well and kept up to date when changes occur. They provide clear guidelines for all requirements of the role. And this is then value added, particularly for a new employee and the rest of the team to review. My recommendation is for the author of the position description reviews their written work by, get this, reading it out loud 
back to yourself as a self-check. I've done this many times over many years and it's been really value added. If you're doing this in your office, you might like to shut the door because you might feel a bit embarrassed that people will think you're talking to yourself. But it's a valuable tool. It's also helpful to ask one of your work colleagues to read and review the, the position description also to check all specifics of the role have been included. Sometimes when we're writing these, we might not have all that information at hand. Compliance requirements for regular training and development covers essential education for everyone in the practice. We know that. That gets drummed into us, doesn't it, for quite over time. Regular review and update training can have team members avoiding it and often lagging behind when it comes to completing the required study for them. What about getting compliance happening by supporting and working through the specific training requirements with everyone at a team meeting. It might be that you're able to set up one or two computers at the meeting for the team so they can work through the training and discuss any aspects of it together. This adds the opportunity to discuss anything that might be unclear or that needs more clarification from others, possibly more skilled team members. Also a great opportunity to take some notes. The individual members of the team can then set aside their own time to complete the required training and submit it with more confidence. Then we look at the encouraging a, a no blame workplace. Cultures of blame can arise at work, in committees, at meetings, at home, just about everywhere. I'm sure we've all been Savvy, or we've learned about that on the wrong end of the stick. Blaming cultures disempower people. They create uncomfortable work relations, and rather than celebrating great work, we blame. Effectively, when blaming others for making a mistake becomes an issue where we make people feel terrible. Not only the blamed person feeling bad, everyone else struggles as well not a good look for any practice, I suspect. A key skill to reduce or better still start the eradication of a toxic environment is to ensure you encourage and engage with each member of your team at some point each day. Saying hello, checking in with each person in your practice is a great start. You may recall something that they discussed with you yesterday. For example, how did Johnny get on his, with his first day at childcare? value added and people like to be included and I'm not just talking about the manager or the leader I'm talking about each other checking in with your your people connecting it's a valuable resource for us all while we may not have the time remember it's the little things that make a difference certainly for me if somebody checking in with me it's quite nice simply um, when we're checking in with each other you might simply ask how are you doing and you wait for an answer people's body language can give out clues as we know if someone is wrong for example lack of eye contact looking away appearing unhappy or just simply not their normal self everyone in your practice team requires a component of training now i've alluded to that above but for example training starts when we're inducting our new employees, our new practitioners, all of the people that join our practices. In our roles, we're continually learning about gaining new skills along the way. At team meetings where regular updates are shared and discussed provides a helpful and supportive learning tool for people attending. Training can be in-house. For example, team meetings where the admin team member gives feedback regarding a, a front desk process that's changed or a new system, or they might share feedback that one of the patients had given them about everyone's service, how great we are, celebrated, it's such a good idea. Information and updates can be discussed at that time by a member of the team who may have attended a recent training and development um, external to the practice. The learning outcomes can be shared with an opportunity for the rest of the team to ask questions and get some some new ideas perhaps. 
Engaging our people works as we all like to feel included, valued, and for example, learning new tasks through delegation is a good example. I've worked with many people in my career and delegation is like a dirty word, but you know, it empowers people. Delegation may be having team members reviewing their own position descriptions. Oh my gosh, could that be possible? Or a new policy and procedure for feedback, comments, and to give suggestions. They then become the owner of those, those documents as well, because it's in their best interest for that to be correct. Mm. Delegation could be learning new aspects of the practice and management software that we use. It provides value added for the learner and provides the ability to support the manager or another member of the team when asked, which can often be the case. Oh, could you just help me finish off this, whatever I'm doing? This also provides backup if required, as well as planned for additional support when someone may be on leave. This one I love is meeting agendas. Invite your team to add to the agenda items and discussion points that they would find helpful at the next team meeting. Have you ever seen people that tend to look like they're going to have a nod off? I think that when they haven't had like any ownership of what we're doing, it might not feel like it's real for them. So having a member of the practice team taking minutes would be rather a learning tool that can add to ongoing learning and growth in their role certainly takes the load off of somebody else who might be doing other things. Empowering our people to confidently share thoughts, suggestions, skills, ideas, contributions, um, or ongoing success ideas is a win-win for your teams, for the lot of you. It's a win for me as the employee, and it's a win for you as the practice. So empowering our people it's important. Okay, thanks, Marion. As you can see by this slide, infection prevention and control requires a whole practice team approach. All staff should receive ongoing training on infection control, including the correct use of PPE and, and your waste disposal. Quite often, the various roles in your team can overlap. For example, a receptionist may be required to cover for your DA in the surgery or in the sterilization room. If a sterilisation breach occurs, is everyone clear on your policy and to follow the correct reporting process? Audits are a great way to review your processes, such as annual hand hygiene and infection control audits. I used an external provider to carry out an audit of the practice infection control procedures, with actually the whole team being involved. This included the surgery changeovers, sterilisation room processes, and our surgical procedure setups. Do you have current staff immunisation records that are reviewed and updated annually? Do you have evidence of your practice environmental cleaning schedule? In my practice, the head nurse was the responsible person to carry out the cleaning audits, and my role as a practice manager was to conduct regular reviews of these. Of course, over the past 12 months, your schedules have been updated with the, re the recommendations given from the Australian Department of Health on a quite a regular basis, I'd imagine. Do you have cleaning schedule templates covering daily, weekly, monthly, and annual tasks for your team? For example, one of my big annual schedule tasks was during the Christmas um, holiday period, I would get our cleaners to actually do the resealing and the polishing of all the hard floor surfaces. There are many great resources available to assist you with infection prevention and control. Well, if we have learned anything over the past 12 months, it has made us realize that we need to be prepared for change and changes can happen quickly. Not every state experienced all five levels of restrictions. But do you now have in place your pandemic response for all the five levels? As a team, you all would have prepared each time the, rest the restrictions changed and faced the challenges together with clear communications with the team almost on a daily basis. You would have planned the changes for your practice, including reviewing and updating your policies and procedures. Your priority at all times is safety for yourself 
your staff and your patients. This pandemic highlighted the need that your infection prevention and control processes need to be flexible to meet the changing environment. Don't allow them to become static. Review and update them regularly. Risk. Risk management is a part of your day-to-day -day management of your practice. Reporting of incidents, breaches, complaints, and quality improvements are all best recorded in registers. Staff meetings should include risk and quality improvements on agendas. Your staff should be encouraged to discuss and report any incidents in an open and transparent environment. Let's address those risks. Record the process and the outcome in the incident register, reducing the risk reoccurring. Your staff can all often provide you with really good quality improvement suggestions that can reduce risk to the, and create a safer working environment, which also can perhaps save the practice money. Do your staff know the procedure the practice has in place if they experience a needle stick injury? Do you have an incident form? Who is it reported to and who records the incident? What follow-up procedures are required? And how do you reduce this risk from reoccurring? On the slide are suggestions of audits you and the team can do in your practice. Discuss the results, plan and develop quality improvements, which will reduce risk. Don't forget a compliments register for your staff. Positive communications from patients should also be recorded. Staff like to hear positive feedback and be recognized for their efforts. I found the registers within practice are useful to record any incidents, complaints, compliments and audits. This also provided me with the evidence that I required for accreditation. Thanks, Karen. Let's look at team communication success. Improving quality and reducing risks in any practice is enhanced when we have effective communication skills with our people, one and all. Getting together as a team is value added for any business. People notice that too when they visit your practices. Our teams, when working collaboratively, communicate well while enjoying a healthy and friendly work environment. Healthy is a big thing, isn't it? It's important to remind ourselves that communication is not limited to our immediate practice team. Our patients are comforted when they receive great service with friendly professional communication. Maintaining a good rapport with our clinical and non-clinical colleagues requires good, effective and efficient skills when communicating. Remember also the art of reading body language of others. When in the surgery, the dental assistant becomes the master of reading the body language of the dentist they are working with at that time, particularly when the patient and the dentist are talking with each other. Myself, I'm a consumer of regular dental health care. I notice how well the rapport between the two works. So never, uh, never put that on hold or think about that. It's important. Now let's have a look at this funny introduction to nominal group technique, NGT. I'm going to give it to you in a nutshell, just to make sure that you get some sort of idea of thinking about whether it's going to be helpful for you or less helpful. Basically, NGT, nominal group technique, assists people in meetings, brainstorming sessions, or a decision-making forum to have people allowed to have a voice. Let me explain. My guess is that many of us have been in meetings, workshops, or other gatherings where some people simply like to talk a lot. In contrast, other people are more quiet and to think better in silence. When decisions are to be made, it's important and valuable that everyone has an opportunity to be heard in a meeting or a gathering or whatever. So NGT, nominal group technique, is a whole of team approach that gives all an opportunity to be part of a decision making process. How good is that? Sometimes we're told this is the new system, but having that with um, a voice will be lovely. So this is how it goes. A facilitator introduces NGT in detail, how it works, 
provides pens and paper for each person participating with a goal to privately invite everyone's input to a topic to be considered with a final decision based on a majority agreement. Now, this is a lot to take in, but you do have some sources coming your way. So, for example, asking the practice team to jot down ideas for the Christmas party this year. Now, that sounds like a really ridiculous topic, but uh, believe you me, in teams that I've worked with, we all have different opinions where it needs to be. So that can be quite helpful. It certainly saves some anguish in a practice I was working in not so long ago. But how, why would we consider NGT? Why can't we just talk to our people? Well, not all people are confident or feeling able to speak up at meetings. New team members might feel uncomfortable to speak up. It could be that there's a bit of an underlying culture of blame. So they think, oh, I don't want to say anything. I feel uncomfortable. Or issues needing to be, be discussed could be uncomfortable. They could be controversial. Or they could be a, a topic that people might be worried that there'll be a possible heated conflict. And many people in our communities um, decide not to be around when there's heated anything. NGT requires an objective facilitator who introduces and states the problem or the issue or the topic that we want to brainstorm. This happens prior to commencing and then checks that everyone understands how this meeting will work. We need everyone to feel comfortable with that. Each person silently thinks of solutions or ideas when considering the problem, the issue or the solution. This whole process happens in silence. Not easy for the Marians in the group that likes to have a chat, but that's really quite beneficial for everybody. Everybody gets a good choice, a, a good ability to think properly. The facilitator confidentially scribes all ideas, thoughts and recommended solutions from the notes handed up. So it's very private. You'll notice in the, the notes that we provided, there might be a bit of a different view to that. You'll work out what works for you. So if we think about gaining a consensus, one of the interesting parts that I had with a practice was the practice was updating, getting new logo, new website, all of those sorts of things. And of course, that included with a new logo, new uniforms. And it was, there was a large group of amazing people that worked there, but they all had different opinions about, oh, I don't know, I want that. Do we have trousers? Do we get two? Do we get one piece? Whatever it is. It created a very interesting challenge. So what we did was NDT and we put it together in a way where everybody could have a voice without feeling that they had to say what Marion said, they could say what they wanted to say. So, and it was all in private, it was scribed and we worked on the basis that the rules are the majority vote is the winner. As it turned out, at the end of it, it all worked out okay, but I have to say there were a few more grumbles after the fact, just to let me know that I hadn't won in my ideas of, of providing that. One thing I'd like to add just very quickly there before we go on to the next slide is one of the great sites as well as Beyond the Blue is um, thinking about just having a look up other sites and seeing what sorts of things are there. There's a lot of information to help us all to learn and learn to talk differently, be differently and be happy, healthy and enjoying life. So I hope this is all helpful. I hope the notes are helpful. Thank you very much, Marion. So as you can see, it definitely is a work in progress. I think the running of your practice is definitely a continuous work um, in progress for, for the whole team. Today's has been all about the key skills and tools for running the practice. As Anna Maria mentioned earlier, you will receive a copy of this presentation, which includes a guide to some of these supportive resources and some more. Anna Maria is now going to give us a demonstration on how Practice Hub can assist you with the management of your practice. Over to you, Anna Maria. Thanks, Karen. Quick question for Marion while I change screens. Yeah. Do you think that the nominal group technique of, gets easier with practice and practices can just start using that by default? Can I just say it takes time to learn to be that facilitator and it is 
a significant amount of work for the solicit um, the person that's actually going to be facilitating because they're going to be scribing from people's private ideas suggestions and they're going to add that to a, a screen or a whiteboard or whatever that you've got using in your practice I love those post-it things that stick on the wall um, then they get a team vote on what's the most popular result and that's how it goes so it can go back and forth and but it's very much in the introduction of it that this is going to be a win-win outcome for the good of all a majority usually comes up with what's good for all so eventually people get used to it and I don't know about you when you've had a uniform you don't particularly like it and then you suddenly just wear it all the time and you're proud to be part of it all so hopefully that helps but it's not the easiest thing to initially learn but I use it very regularly I've used it in community groups all sorts of things hope that helps it's terrific thanks Marion all right, so I'm going to do a uh, quick run through of the Practice Hub platform. The parts that are sort of most relevant to the four topics that we've covered off today. Um, it's by no means a comprehensive view of what's in the platform. Um, and at the end of the demonstration, we'll give you some information on where you can find out more details um, to see what, uh, what else it can do. But let's get started. So focusing on um, equipment, which is where we started our presentation. So in Practice Hub, we've got three registers that uh, are quite useful for when it comes to managing your equipment. So that would be the equipment register, a contracts register and an insurance register. So let's have a look first at the equipment register. All right, so the equipment register, I tend to think serves sort of three different functions. Um, it acts as um, a asset register. It then also acts as a maintenance scheduler. And finally, it's a document storage solution. So any documentation relating to the equipment can be added into the register here. So let's have a look at our autoclave, for example. So things that we can see here is we've got um, a link to the user manual, for example. So no more rustling around in drawers trying to find the right manual for the right piece of equipment. Most stuff is online now, so you could easily incorporate a hyperlink to the user manual. And if you can't find the link, you could have a soft copy of the document and upload that. But at the very least, it is clearly linked to that particular item. So from an asset register perspective, you can add things like the serial number, the model, where it's located, is it owned or rented, when did you get it, how much did you pay, all of that information is there and things like the warranty date. Then when it comes to scheduling maintenance or certification and calibration is also required with your autoclave, you can put in the frequency uh, required, you can include information as to who does the maintenance. And you can set the dates. When was it last done? When is it next due? And that will give you those alerts and reminders when those dates are coming up beforehand. So you can plan and book those things accordingly. And of course, as I mentioned, the other thing you can do is you can attach the relevant documents. So I've had my autoclave calibrated. I can attach a copy of the calibration report. So all that information is easily accessible in one place. The other thing that you can also do in Practice Hub is that you can cross-reference items in the registers with other parts of the platform. So you can cross-reference it, for example, with your policy and procedure relating to documentation and maintenance when it comes to sterilisation. You can also cross-reference it with the contract. So perhaps like Karen mentioned, she had three autoclaves, you've got one supplier, you can easily link the piece of equipment to the contract in the contracts register. So I can see some information, uh, this is the annual servicing, what else they do, a little note that there's a call out charge if it's an ad hoc kind of thing. But who does the work? Who's our contact? And again, making that information really simple for people to find. Once it's in the system, you don't have to keep going around looking for it. Once again, when it comes to attaching documents in the contract register, you might like to attach a copy of the actual contract with your supplier so that if you ever need to go back and look at the fine print, you can easily download the document and go through that. And similarly, once again, 
we can cross-reference it with the other items in the equipment register as well. Also things you can see here, the duration of the contract and therefore the expiry date. And the third register that can be useful when it comes to thinking about your equipment, because it is a valuable asset to your practice, is you probably have business insurance to cover damage, loss, theft, whatever it might be. So in the insurance register, you can include information regarding your insurance policy, which once again, who's the policy with, who do we contact, that sort of information easily accessible. So those are the key things when it comes to managing your equipment where Practice Hub is particularly useful. So we might move on to human resource management next. And I'm going to go to the policy and procedures manual. And in our Practice Hub site, we have a suite of templates that uh, you can use if you don't have your own content. But in there, for example, under human resource management, all those key things, as Marion mentioned, the all important position descriptions, but things also like, you know, different tasks and roles and who's responsible, the staff code of conduct, something that's very topical, of course, at the moment is your social media policy, and then things like dress code and presentation as well. So having those policies and procedures in there is very useful and once again that ability to attach relevant documents so under our position descriptions policy we can also link a couple of the policy and position descriptions as well so that's very important the other thing that you can also do within practice hub is that you can set a requirement for people to sign off um, that they have read and understood a policy. So this being the social media policy, for example, I think everybody needs to sign off on that so that everyone's clear about the rules. So once you're happy with the policy, you can save it and you can publish it and notify those people that they need to sign off. So let's just put a little message updated, free, I don't know, Facebook. So put a message in there as to the reason for the change. And now all the people that we've selected will get an alert on their dashboard. But when they come to the page, what they'll see is that they're required to read this. And down the bottom, there's the ability for them to do an automatic electronic sign off on that policy. So a couple of things that you've ha have happened there while I've made that change. Firstly, I've got an audit trail of the changes that I made and the reason which I put in the notes, but also every time a staff member signs off on that policy, I can track the date when they signed off on that policy. If I update this in three months time, I send it out again, they sign off again, I keep track of those sign offs. So we avoid this whole process of circulating bits of paper and emails and then working out who has or hasn't responded. Another thing that you can do within Practice Hub to kind of tie to that information that they've signed off on or those policies is you can assign learning modules. So it's all well and good to have your practice team busily signing off that they have uh, understood and read and agree to comply with the privacy and confidentiality policies. But within Practice Hub, we have some online learning modules that are pre-configured and cover what we think are probably the biggest risk areas for anyone in the healthcare sector. So you can tie off those sign off of the policies with education. So you now have evidence of that understanding as well. Just also very quickly from a human resource management perspective as well, within the Practice Hub system, we have this application called Certificate of Insurance. And it's terrific for your practitioners who have professional indemnity. You can put the information in here and it will send them automatic alerts when renewals are due for them to go in and add their new details via an online form. Again, if the policy lapses, you'll be able to see quite clearly um, if that it's lapsed, you can follow up with them so that they can update their information. The other thing that we have, again, from a perspective, I guess, of saving you time, making you more efficient, giving you peace of mind, is our APRA application. So this allows you to enter the APRA details uh, of any of your 
practitioners and it will automatically check with the ARPA database on a regular basis, on a daily basis in fact, and if there are any changes to their status you'll get alerted or if when they come around to November they don't do their annual renewal you'll also see that as well. So those are two terrific ways in which you can, I guess, save some time and be a bit more efficient around managing those risks as well. The other thing that a number of our clients do within our Practice Hub platform is create a category for personnel. So for each member of the team, you can add a page, you can put some information in there. So again, a bit like a personnel file. Most importantly, you can ensure that only the right people have access to that category. So it's not the sort of thing that you need everybody to be able to see. You can manage who can view the content here and you can also view uh, manage who can view any documents that you attach. So it might be their signed contract, it might be their um, performance review, it could be their first aid certificates, all of those things can be linked to their page in here as well. Moving along to infection control. So once again, we do have a suite of policies, but just to give you an example of how this can work, we use the example of cleaning. So Karen mentioned doing the cleaning audit in her practice. And so within Practice Hub, you could have your policy relating to your cleaning and linked to that policy, you could also have your template for the environmental cleaning audit. So if somebody needs to do that on a regular basis, they have that template that they can easily download and complete. But to make it even more simple and more kind of, you know, set your mind at ease, you can also link these things um, to a task as well. So we do have a task management function. So bringing it all together, you have the policy, you have the documents required to implement that policy, and then you have the task reminder to tell you what needs to be done, by whom, and how often. So going over to our tasks area, what we can see is that this is an audit to confirm the cleaning has been performed as per the cleaning checklist. We can see the steps that need to be taken by the person who's doing that. You can also see that I've set it to be done every month on the first Wednesday of the month. And if I have a look in the assigning the tech, the task, um, I've assigned it to our dental assistants. So they will be the people responsible for completing that. And once again, I've connected up that cleaning audit template and I've also related it to those two policies that relate to the cleaning of the practice. When that person completes the audit, they will upload it as part of the completion when they do this task. So they cannot complete the task without having uploaded the completed audit form as well. So again, it's these automated processes that allow you to spend less time wondering what you've forgotten and use your time to follow up what isn't being done. And I suspect if your team knows you can easily monitor this stuff, they'll get on and do it. So you have a higher chance of people complying and completing these um, in, steps as well. All right, so that was infection control. Let's move along to risk and quality management. So Karen mentioned uh, during her talk about the importance of registers and how they simplify the process for managing your risks and your quality improvements. So some of the registers that we like to um, create in Practice Hub are things like an organisation-wide risk register. So that'll cover things like your business risks, safety risks and clinical risks. Um, your incident reporting, so again, things like the needle stick injuries, any compliance breaches, the quality improvement, um, a complaints and compliments register, but you could also go to the extent of adding things like a hazardous substances and your staff immunisations in there as well. So let's have a look, for example, at the compliments register. So very simple table. It's more important that you complete these things. One of the things I would do is I would set a frequency of, you know, if we have monthly uh, team meetings, then I would say every month, let's, uh, let's review this just to check if there's anything else that needs to be added, things that we need to um, raise at the meeting because presumably we've got a standing item on the agenda relating to compliments, complaints, quality, risk. Um, and so you can add those uh, reviews in there as well, set that review date. 
Now, when I mentioned uh, about the personnel section back in the manual, I mentioned about the fact you can restrict who can see what parts of the manual. So your normal users um, can't necessarily edit the content because that could be um, quite confusing for everyone, but they can send you what we call a contribution. So they can go through and they can say, I've got something I'd like to add to the compliments register. And so here they can send you a contribution. Mrs. Brown sent a thank you card. She was really grateful that we could fit in her son for emergency appointment after school on Friday. So that's something that you can then add to that register and can then be shared with the rest of the team as well. Those are the key things to highlight in this demonstration. Just, I guess, circling back to the dashboard, which you saw when I first uh, logged in, everything kind of comes home to roost in the dashboard. And as an administrator, the alerts are broken up into things that you personally can look after. So you can action these tasks. These are items in the manual. You have that contribution. You've got some policies due for review. You have a policy and procedure that needs to be signed off every 12 months. You have three of those, in fact, to go through and sign off on. Um, you've got some items in the registers that are due. So equipment maintenance and insurance policies probably due to expire, contract due to expire. So these are things that you can action. Over on the team alerts, you've got the things that your team needs to action that you're monitoring. So you can clearly see there are some policies for people to sign off. There are some training modules for them to complete. Uh, one of your practitioners needs to upload or update their certificate of insurance. So these are all ways in which all of that setting up the system um, can come back and give you that peace of mind that these things will be here, you'll get those reminders, um, and you can action those and keep on top of all of these things, hopefully with a goal of making you much more efficient and use your time more efficiently in the practice as well. All right, I am going to uh, take us back to our presentation, just to kind of wrap up the last couple of things in here. A quick word about documentation. The Dental Board has recently announced that they will be auditing registered dental practitioners for compliance um, to registration standards and we'll need, they'll need to provide a supporting documentation. Some examples of that would be their qualifications, their hours of CPD that they've logged, um, confirmation of their professional uh, indemnity insurance uh, and those sorts of things. So somewhere like Practice Hub is a good place to keep all that information easily in one place so that if you're audited, it's very simple to collate all the information and show them. As I mentioned, for example, in the registers, immunisation status, as Marion mentioned, the all important in-house, you know, training, whether it's in-house or external, but important to record all of that training as well. And having a staff induction system in place. And part of that would be the sign off of the policies and procedures. You know, I think it's very powerful for new staff members to be able to see, you know, it's very transparent what their policies are, what their position description includes and that sort of thing. All right, so just coming up to next steps. If you are a Practice Hub client and you'd like more information um, about some training or a reminder of how some of the uh, different applications work, or you'd like to find out about accreditation support that we can provide, please let us know. I'm sure our support team would be delighted to hear from you. If you're not a Practice Hub client, as I said, the demonstration was a very light overview um, and I'd suggest you contact us via our website, email or phone, and one of our sales team can do a one-to-one -one online demonstration with you where they can talk to you about the features and in particular how they apply in your practice setting. Lastly, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much. We appreciate that you're all very busy people. Um, you will be sent a survey at the end of the webinar, so if you could please complete that. And in particular, if there's any other topics that you think would be of interest that you would like us to present, a recording of the email is being sent to you. And a lot of the references that both Karen and Marion have spoken about today will be in the same email with the webinar recording link. And once again, if you do have any questions, please feel free to contact us uh, at info at practicehub.com.au. 
once again, thank you so much to our presenters, Karen and Marion. Thank you. Awesome job. And thank you to our attendees. And we look forward to um, seeing you again next time.